Why is it that with sparkling water, I'm always playing guessing games with what flavor I'm drinking? Is it citrus? Is it aluminum can flavored? Mm, not sure. Sparkling ice though, they really mean flavor. Like in your face flavor. Orange mango, black raspberry. Don't even get me started on the strawberry lemonade. Kiwi strawberry slid right into my taste buds DMs last night and let them know who's boss. No subtleties there and no sugar either, but it does have vitamins and antioxidants. Find sparkling ice at a major grocery store or club retailer near you. Sparkling ice, anything but subtle. Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations and book recommendation episodes, as well as insider information on all of the newest releases that I personally endorse and on the publishing industry in my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations, to find my backlist of interviews, or to check out my summer reading guide for 2023, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. There is also a link to the summer reading guide in the show notes. I am thrilled to announce that I have launched a new Patreon level for those interested in accessing even more unique bonus content. My original level, called Page Turners, still includes my popular Early Reads program, where patrons have access to monthly early digital reads through NetGalley, and exclusive pre-publication author chats, as well as monthly bonus episodes and fun surprise content. My new level is entitled Lit Lovers and includes all of the page turners benefits, as well as access to my new Traveling Galley program, where patrons have early access to at least three to four new titles a month that are in print galley form and are passed along to other members. A monthly fiction-nonfiction pairing episode, a monthly episode containing bonus, spoiler-filled interviews with three authors, And finally, read alike requests via email. Lit lovers can send me a book they loved, and I will respond with similar titles. This was such a popular and time consuming add on for me that I am moving it off of my main show. My true love is author conversations, and I want to be able to keep that focus on the show. Today, I am chatting with Kim Wickens about Lexington. Kim grew up in Dallas and practiced as a criminal defense lawyer in New Mexico for 20 years. She subsequently turned her attention to writing, which she studied at Kenyon College and has devoted the last several years to researching this book. She lives with her husband and her son in Lexington, Kentucky, where she trains in dressage with her three horses. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drink ag the number one dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Kim. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I'm really excited to chat about Lexington. What a fascinating book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what I usually do is have authors start out giving a quick synopsis of the book for those that won't have read it yet. So could you do that for me? Sure. You know, this is a story of a 19th century racehorse uh, who ran in the antebellum uh, South. And racehorsing back then was, you know, it was quite different than it is now. So today, our longest race here in America is the Belmont Stakes, which is about a mile and a half. Back then, horses ran what were called heat races. And so they were not running just one mile or one and a half miles in the case of the Belmont. They were running these heats that could consist anywhere of a one mile heat all the way up to a four mile heat race. 
the four mile heat races being the upper echelon, the very top level of racing back then. And so how it would work is that, for example, in a four mile heat, which not every horse could run a four mile heat, only your very best horses could run these great distances of four mile heats. But how it would work is that a horse, horses would run in a four mile heat, for example, four miles. And then they would have a rest period after that four miles of about 45 minutes. And then they would go out and they would do it again. They would run another four miles. And this could go on until you had at least one horse winning two heats. And so if you had horse A winning heat one and then horse B winning heat two, now, now you need a tie-breaking heat, essentially, you know, to find out who your, who your winner is of the overall race. And so this could go on and did in some cases for 20 miles. And so it, it was quite astonishing what these horses did back then. Of course, they were bred and, and trained a lot differently. But what makes Lexington so interesting is not only was he a horse who could race and did race these four mile heat races. So he overcame, you know, just quite a bit in order to be able to do that. But on top of that, this was a horse who, at the very beginning of, of his racing career, started to lose his eyesight. And so you have another level of difficulty added on to what this horse was dealing with and what he was able to overcome to accomplish what he did in, the, in these races. And so, you know, the terminology back then for such a spectacular horse that could really just have so much courage and stamina and drive during these races was bottom, B-O-T-T-O-M. And that was the terminology that they used for to really define a spectacular horse such as Lexington. And he certainly had what they would call bottom back then. And so at the time that Lexington raced, which was pre-Civil War, so he was racing in 1854, 1855. And so you already had at that point quite a division across the country. It was really a torn uh, nation, you know, at that point. And he really ran and gave a lot of people hope, essentially, you know, for what he was able to accomplish out there, because it was pretty common knowledge back then that this horse was racing with one eye blind and the other one impaired. And everything that he did and raced at that point, I mean, it just drew throngs of people, you know, to his races. And even people who could not attend his races in person, you were having an invested interest in what this horse was doing. There was betting on this horse throughout the country. And uh, his name was appearing in periodicals everywhere, not just in the racing periodicals that existed in New York and elsewhere, but in other periodicals. You know, there was a saying that I put at the beginning of the of the book, because it's such a great quote, that Lexington was known not just in the north and 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 not just in the in the south, but he was known in places where racehorses were not even known, meaning that his name crossed over into barriers where people where racehorses weren't even on their thought process. This horse made an impact on everybody at that time. That was his racing career. And that should be theoretically where the book ends. But this horse was so phenomenal that uh, he then goes on to have just this incredible uh, career as a sire and, in fact, becomes one of the foundational sires of the current uh, American thoroughbred. And uh, his lineage, I mean, it's really his legacy is, is this lineage, this line, this bloodline that he is able you know, to establish under the auspices of his owner. You know, he's, he's owned in, in the book by two different owners. He transfers hands after his racing career into the hands of a breeder in Kentucky who then stands Lexington at his farm in Woodburg Farm in Midway, Kentucky, where he then basically breeds the horse using very ideal methods, uh, you know, new methods, you know, that were commonly not uh, utilized in America. He had a very judicious view of looking at the type of matings that he wanted to create with Lexington to bring out the very best of the very best and was very successful doing that, which is why Lexington was able to establish the great bloodline that he did. However, it was not easy because at this point, when he's in his breeding career, is the start of the Civil War. 
And civil war in Kentucky was just, as, as you can imagine, with Kentucky being a border state. I mean, Kentucky, you know, you have a torn nation, but then you have Kentucky being extra torn because you have citizens that are divided, citizens that are for the Union, citizens for the, that are for the Confederacy. And so you just really, within the state itself, had just this, this huge torn and divided state. And it, it was really became open ground, the state did, for these guerrilla factions, you know, to pop up all over the place. And so you had these Confederate guerrillas and other guerrillas just running, you know, roughshod all over the state and committing thefts and stealing silver, gold, and of course, being in Kentucky, stealing horses, because horses were what was the most sought after commodity back then. I mean, because these horses were how these people escaped and how they rode from one place to the other. And you, the faster horse you had, the better, because that meant you could outrun you know, the Union Guard that was chasing you down, so to speak. And so, as you can imagine, thoroughbreds and racehorses were the most sought after horses in Kentucky at that time. And of course, Woodburn Farm, being known for breeding these fantastic racehorses, was certainly not immune. And, and so it, it came under, you know, basically the raiding, you know, that was done by these guerrilla factions. I mean, it was, it was their prime target. And, you know, it was really a situation that could have upended completely the goal of Robert Alexander, the second owner of Lexington and his Woodburn farm, because had these guerrillas ultimately been successful in capturing Lexington, that would have ended the bloodline that, that, uh, we now know that that had such an impact on our modern thoroughbreds. And then the last thing that is so interesting about Lexington is where he ended up after he died. Yes. Yes. And so yet again, you would think his story would end there, but he, he goes on. And so because he was such a celebrity horse and such a well-known horse at the time that he passed on, the owner, which was the brother of Robert Alexander at that point, the owner of Woodburn Farm and ultimately of, of Lexington when he passed, started receiving applications uh, for the bones of the horse, the horse's skeleton. And he was turning down a lot of these applications until he received an application from the Smithsonian Institute, which was, was just a starting, you know, up and coming museum at that time. And they requested quote unquote, if I can remember the exact quote from the handwritten letter to A.J. Alexander, it was basically we would request and the remarkable remains of this highly regarded animal. And so he did agree to allow the Smithsonian to exhume the skeleton of Lexington and then to articulate it uh, for purposes of display at what was then the centennial, you know, in Pennsylvania. And so I think more than anything, he was, he was very hopeful that the skeleton would be exhibited there at the centennial. And we believe that it was. And then ultimately Lexington ends up on display in the Smithsonian Museum. But even that is not a perfect story because there, there were incidents of where is the skeleton? The skeleton had been moved to the attic and of course, then people were trying to get the skeleton removed from the attic and, and placed back on display where it, they believed it should be. And so it, it's really a convoluted tell that, that uh, goes in and out in terms of just the, the journey of this horse while he was alive and then even in death. It really is just absolutely fascinating. And what is so interesting is that until the last couple of years, there wasn't a ton written about Lexington in the present. Correct. So how did you first learn about Lexington and how did you decide to write about him? You know, it was one of those, it, it was not planned, right? It, it was not planned. And I think sometimes that's, that's the way these things work is when you're, when it's just completely out of the blue. And, and so I was reading a book on the racehorse man of war because I, I love racehorses. I love reading about various racehorses, Sea Biscuit, of course, you know, who could not love that book? And so I came across this book on Man of War, and there's several out there, but this is, this is one that I was uh, reading by Paige uh, Cooper and Roger Treat. And in describing, in, in that book, when they're describing 
Man of War, the racehorse, and the impact that Man of War had on the 20th century. They compared him to this antebellum horse named Lexington of the 19th century. And they said that basically both horses had this grand ability to be able to draw in the nation and really lift those who saw them out of their ordinary lives. Of course, I I was just blown away by even just this one statement in the book. And I wanted to know more about Lexington because I had never heard of him, even though I was a, a racehorse lover. I'd never heard of this horse. And um, so I, I really just started researching him out of curiosity. And one thing led to another. And, and I was just so astounded that when I started researching him, I could not find anything. There was no book on Lexington. You know, I thought for sure I could get on Wikipedia and find a book on Lexington that I could read. And there was none. And so it really was, you know, one thing led to another, more or less. And, and I ended up, um, you know, I was practicing law then, <laughs> you know, and I ended up taking my vacations, you know, from my law practice in order to, to just go to various places across the nation to try to, to find things that I could about this horse. And it just, it really led into a quest that really led into, you know, maybe I should try to, to write about this. I mean, how presumptuous of me to try to think to do something like that, but that's, that's what I, I thought to do. And, and it just snowballed into this, this massive research project that I ended up writing. Well, I've read your acknowledgments, so I know you did an immense amount of research. But let's talk a little bit about it. And then once you compiled all of this research, what was it like deciding what to include and what not to include? Because I'm sure there was just so much detail that you could have written a book five times the size of Lexington. And so you really had to decide to parse it down, figure out what was relevant and what wasn't to the story you were telling. Yeah, you know, and and in fact, I did write a lot of it. And, you know, my editor, Susanna Porter at Valentine, as well as my agent, they would both tell me that this was a tangent, (laughs) that I had written a, a slight little tangent that we needed to revisit because it wasn't necessary. But for me, the way to really understand how things were occurring or to really understand how the individual may may have impacted the story was to write it out. You know, it's one thing to read about it or, you know, think about it in your head. But for me, it was actually getting it down on paper that really helped me flesh through some of these thoughts and understandings. Uh, horse travel, for example, or, or the impact of horses in the, in the Civil War and how the horses were used in the Civil War. And so there is much, much more that I have written that's not even in this book. And and that was my process of trying to understand how things came together and and so forth. And um, the Metairie Cemetery, you know, so it was the Metairie race course where Lexington raced, you know, where he did all of his fantastic races. But of course, that race course eventually becomes a cemetery. I've written about it. I put it up on my website because it's not in the book. It It goes beyond the the scope of the book. But um, it it really was very uh, challenging to try to pull back and and try not to put all of this overwhelming story in there. And so I have to say that a lot of this was not uh, my doing, but the guidance of of my editor and my agent, you know, along the way and saying, let's focus the story more on this. And let's, this all is very interesting on the outside, but let's Let's put that aside for now and, and draw the story more in this way. So we don't have a thousand page book. Correct. Correct. Well, and there's really two components to that, because the first is you're learning all of this really cool information and you'd love to share all of it with the reader. You know, I, I don't want to leave this out. It's so interesting. I don't want to leave that out. But at some point you do have to. But also what you just mentioned, even though in the end we may not read the portions of the book that have been pulled out. They still helped you write the story. So they served a purpose, helped you process the information, figure out what should be included and what not. So it's not like it's wasted. It's just not something that makes it into the final draft. Correct. The other thing that I think would be so interesting about a horse like Lexington is it was so long ago. So there are only two photographs that exist or have existed. How difficult was it to write about a horse that you couldn't see run? You could only see these two photographs and a few paintings of him. Was that difficult? It was difficult. And and it was very frustrating because, you know, I'm writing a nonfiction book. And so I'm limited by uh, the facts as they are recorded. And and so, of course, we have no video reels or, or old film reels of Lexington running to, to try to get an idea what 
how he supposedly was so graceful in all of his movements that you could hardly tell, you know, how difficult these races were. You know, he just made it look so easy, according to people who saw him run that then wrote about it. And so a lot of the descriptions are from various eyewitnesses to his races. But the actual race records themselves, which appeared in the, the New Orleans Picayune, as well as the um, Spirit of the Times, which was a, a sporting paper out of New York. These races, they were difficult and frustrating in certain respects, because if you were to go back and read all of these races at that time that were occurring across the nation at that time, they almost all sound the same. And so there's very little, you know, they give great descriptions of the crowds and, and so forth, but there's, there's very little information in terms of what was actually occurring in the race. You know, LeCompte is now, LeCompte led, you know, in the second heat until Lexington overcame him in the home stretch, you know, and, and that's really what you're getting without much of the drama of what was occurring in the actual race itself. And so that the races were really hard in that respect to try to flesh out and to try to make more exciting for the reader when there was such limited information in the race record itself. I just thought that had to be fascinating. And even to have an exact idea of what he looked like. I mean, you do have a few paintings, a few photos, but that's it. And it's usually from the side. So I just thought, how hard? Yeah, it, it was difficult. And, and a lot of that, you know, uh, in order to be able to describe him came from, there were several descriptions of people that saw him that would then either write poems about him. I think this horse had two or three poems written about him or that would describe in some manner uh, what he looked like. And thank goodness that they did that because we are then able to know, for example, that he had this, this humongous uh, backbone. You know, in other words, this horse, when you read the, des the descriptions that people gave of him who saw him, you can understand that this horse had more than likely a tremendous lung capacity and heart Capacity. I mean, this horse was basically built to run. You get a description of the wide jawbone, the wide nostrils that made breathing much easier for him. And so because of these physical descriptions that eyewitnesses gave with the, with the broad backbone, the broad shoulders, the broad jawbone, you get some idea what type of a build this horse had uh, that's beyond what is depicted, like you said, in the in just the flat image in a painting that's from the side. That makes sense. And you touched on Lexington's legacy earlier, but let's talk a little bit more about that because it's truly impressive. Twelve of the thirteen Triple Crown winners descend from him. Yes, I mean, so so this horse, you know, when I was looking at the pedigrees of, you know, I wanted to to try to give some idea how this horse impacted you know, the modern breed. And, you know, the horses running today, for example, you know, the blood has been so diluted, right, that the horses running today cannot, we can't say, for example, that uh, if we were to have a triple crown winner today, that that triple crown winning horse was as a result of Lexington and his stamina and strength. But he appears in the pedigree. And every time the horse appears in, in by name in a pedigree, it's called a cross. And when I started looking at uh, some of the famous horses that we know, Man of War, Sea Biscuit, all of the Triple Crown winners, uh, the horses of, you know, that are ranked horse, horse of the year, you know, say for the last 10 years. When I started looking at these, these horses that readers would recognize by name today, like Secretariat and Seattle Slough, it was just amazing how many times Lexington appeared as a cross in uh, their pedigree. And so, of course, the closer in time that the horse was to Lexington, the greater his impact would be on the performance of that horse. But the fact that he exists so much in these pedigrees really shows us how much of a, a foundation he was in, in establishing the early uh, you know, American thoroughbred line. And when I talked to a bloodstock agent to also try to give me some direction in how I could best describe this, you know, he, I mean, basically all of these, these horses that we know 
or or may not be known, but these are the the modern thoroughbred uh, sires that we can think of, like uh, Mr. Prospector or Northern Dancer or, or Domino that goes a little further back. Those are horses that would not have existed had it not been for Lexington. And so he really did, you know, establish a cornerstone or, you know, a basis for what we uh, consider the American thoroughbred today. You know, when I when I started researching the book and I wanted to get some idea, I I contacted the jockey club and I commissioned them to run a search for me of horses where Lexington appears in the pet in the pedigree. And and we limited the search. It was a very limited search to only the past 20 years and only horses that ran in graded stakes races. So we're now talking about horses that ran in the most important races uh, in the United States, They're not claiming races, not allowance races, graded stakes races, meaning they had to establish some level of competence to get up to that, that point where they could run a graded stakes race. And so it's a very limited search. But the, the results that they gave back uh, were just, it, it was just, when I printed the, the results off after the, you know, from the email that they sent me in running the search, it was reams and reams and reams and reams of paper that were single spaced with names on each line of horses that had Lexington in the pedigree. I mean, it was just astounding when you think how much impact one horse could have. And even going a little further back. So, you know, I did this in the back of the book in the epilogue where the first 20, you know, winners of the Kentucky Derby, the first 20 winners of the Belmont Stakes, the first 20 winners of the Travers and the Saratoga Cup, all of these horses can trace in what we would call tell mel, meaning a direct mel line, all the way to Lexington within one to three generations. And so that is just astounding when you think how much impact he had to have 20 winners, the first 20 winners, you know, in each of these very significant races that we know of today, descending directly from him. It's mind boggling. It is. It's very mind boggling. I had to reread those sections a couple of times just to digest all of that. I thought not only is it incredible coming from him, but also the breeder. He clearly knew what he was doing. He did. And I think that's a lot of it, you know, is Alexander's methods that he that he utilized, because obviously the horse had some great genetic qualities that he was able to pass on. But in the hands of the a less ideal person or a less thoughtful person, we might not know the American thoroughbred that we know today. And so Alexander, it was really judicial crossing. I mean, he, he really took great care in selecting the mares that he would allow to be bred to Lexington, knowing that if he put a mare that had a great pedigree herself, you know, that had uh, been sired and by a horse that also was known for stamina or a horse that was also known for, for speed, as well as if her dam had also been a, a great dam uh, in passing on these qualities. So if you took a quality mare and you bred that mare to Lexington, if you had a, a mare that was whose sire was known for great stamina and you took that and then you took that in the mare and crossed it with Lexington, who was known for stamina, more than likely in Alexander's judgment, you were going to get a really phenomenal horse for stamina. And so that's what he did. And it, it, it really was what we would call Nick breeding today, uh, where he created a Nick, meaning a uh, a certain line of mares that came from a certain sire and then took those mares to breed to Lexington. And he was very successful in creating these really great colts. Yes, that is so impressive. What do you think it is about horse stories that appeals so much to people? You've mentioned Seabiscuit, Man of War, thinking about the $80 racehorse. There are just some really great horse stories out there and people eat them up. Why is that? You know, they do. And I also want to mention Geraldine uh, Brooks's book, Horse, which is the um, historical uh, fiction version of Lexington, and which people love as well. And I think I think they really love the, the Lexington and Jarrett aspect of that story, you know, that relationship with the man and the horse. And, and you know, and I don't I don't know if it's that people are, are seeing something that's demonstrated in in the horse that is inspiring to them. I mean, obviously, because these animals, they're not just animals that are out there running. And we get a sense of 
that, it, and I, I put this quote in one of the, the very last chapter that deals with Lexington's actual races. And it's a quote from William Henry Herbert, who was a, uh, a historian, but then who was present at the very last race of Lexington. And he gave just a beautiful account of that last race that Lexington ran. And he, he says, you know, as he's watching the horse at the very end of the race, he says, how presumptuous of us mortals to think that such an animal has got no soul. And so it's, it's, I think, very recognizable that these animals do have an understanding and a feeling and are able to then in their own way uh, transmit that, you know. And, and so I think it's that people would like to identify with uh, the animal in that respect and also in the human relations that the animal is able to have with its, its, its human counterparts and, and then with society as a whole. I mean, for a horse to be able to, to draw that magnitude of people from across the nation in a torn nation and, and be able to appeal to them on that level is just astounding. And, and so I think we see it and have seen it, you know, in, in so much of, of our society for hundreds of years. I think that's right. I'm always just fascinated by that because clearly it completely entrances people. And I was saving Geraldine Brooks for the next question, but I'm so glad you brought her up because I loved horse. I've interviewed her about it. I have a Patreon group associated with my podcast and I do fiction, nonfiction pairings. And I was so excited when I love Lexington because I'm going to put the two together for one of my episodes because they're a perfect pairing. And she blurbed your book. And one of the things I wanted to mention, because this is a theme that I think comes up pretty regularly in books and publishing generally is these certain ideas or entities or horses or whatever it is that all bubble to the surface at the same time. So, so interesting that she wrote Horace last year. Well, I mean, obviously she was writing it for a while. You were writing for a while, but her book came out last year. Your book came out this year about the same horse that had not been written about for so long. It, it is so bizarre. It is so strange. And I was lucky enough to get to have lunch with her when she came to Lexington the first time she was promoting a horse here. We, we, I mean, who gets to sit down and have lunch with Geraldine Brooks? I did. <laughs> it was so fascinating to sit down and talk to her because, you know, we were talking about our research, you know, trips and she's like, you know, I even went to West Point. And I said, I went to West Point too. You know, so we were talking about, had we known about each other? Because we didn't. Had we known about each other, we could have, you know, combined our research efforts to some extent. I mean, it, it's just so weird. You know, it's so bizarre that, that, the horse has not been written about for eons, and then two people come about the same time and start researching this horse with different with different goals, you know, but really the same goal, but really different goals, you know, with the historical fiction and nonfiction. I mean, I, I just don't think it could have been done any other. I, you couldn't have planned it, you know. It was just very bizarre. But um, I loved that book, and I thought, it, you know, reading it with the interest that I had, I I was really love the story. And I love what she did, you know, with the, with the story of Jarrett and Lexington and then bringing him into the modern world. I agree. And I've always been a fan of nonfiction fiction pairings, because I feel like they each serve a different purpose. And you really can learn so much from one and the other putting them together. And so that's the whole reason when I first saw Lexington with the horse on the cover, I was like, that has to be the same horse. So I was so excited because I thought this will be great. What an interesting combination. But yeah, maybe it's kismet. But you know, that just seems to happen over and over again, where some topic has not been written about and suddenly two and three people are writing about it in a very similar time frame. Yeah, you guys could have done your research together had you known. Yes, yes, we could have <laughs> talked about that. Like, yes. because you know, the, the West Point trip, for example, we both went there, but we could not find the smoking gun, so to speak, in terms of how exactly did Richard Tinbrook leave West Point? And, and we talked about that fact. And, and it could have been definitely okay, you go to West Point and, and look at that. I'm going to go over here to the Metairie or, or whatever, you know. But um, very interesting, though. I think that she started about two years before me. So I think she started in 2010. And, you know, I didn't start till the end of 2012. But, I mean, regardless, you know, regardless, um, it's very bizarre that uh, this all happened and we did not know about each other until the very end here. I agree completely. The other thing that I thought was really interesting when I was checking out your website was the elk antlers. 
So they're around your initials. And then I found on your website, your explanation about them. But I would love for you to tell my listeners about that because I thought it was so interesting. I love the elk antlers. I really love the elk antlers. And the whole story there is that in the the 19th century, I mean, as you can imagine, there's betting on everything, right? There's everything is a, a betting opportunity or everything is a race. You know, everything is is some kind of a, a sporting endeavor. And so you would have these boat races, these steamboat races on the Mississippi River, you know, and they were some of them were planned. You know, the the Natchez and the Robert E. Lee, that was a, a steamboat race that was actually planned. But some of these races would just spontaneously happen. You know, you would see uh, steamboat X over here and you're on steamboat Y and those two steamboats captains would decide that they're going to race and whoever gets to the next port first is the winner. And so what what started happening with these steamboat races, and of course, not all of them were jovial and fun. There were some horrible sinkings that happened as a result of some of these steamboat races. But um, whoever would would win, you know, the race in the case of Robert E. Lee uh, steamboat and the Natchez steamboat, would then be awarded the Antlers for being the fastest boat on the Mississippi. So on that particular race, the Robert E. Lee won the race and was awarded the the Golden Antlers, which were then nailed above the wheelhouse door until the next fastest steamboat could claim them from the Robert E. Lee. And so whoever next beat the Robert E. Lee, those Antlers would then be taken down from the wheelhouse door and given to the next fastest boat. And so kind of in line with that, when Lexington became what we now know as the fastest horse in the world at four miles, a racing fan, he was then at Woodburn Farm, but a racing fan of his took a pair of Elks antlers and sent them to Woodburn Farm and asked that they be nailed above the stall door of Lexington to honor the fact that he was the fastest horse in the world. I'm totally enthralled with how elk antlers became the symbol of the winner, like how that got started. You know, I don't know. I have this book that I bought, you know, to try to understand this. And it's called Take the Horns, you know, because that's what it would was called. You took the horns from the next fastest boat. And unfortunately, I could not find anywhere that said, why, why antlers? You know, why antlers? Why is that the symbol? You know, maybe for the speed of the the elks. I don't know, you know, but why antlers? Maybe they were easy as a symbol to use to as a, a physical symbol, you know, to use in terms of being known physically to the outside of a boat so that everyone could behold and see that that was the fastest boat. And elk antlers are majestic and they're large. And if you get the really big ones, you know, they very much stand out. So I could see where I guess you could associate that with these majestic antlers are a sign of winning. But I just thought that it was so interesting and I'd never heard it before. And the expression, take the horn, like I didn't know where that had come from. Yeah, take the horns. Yeah. Well, I always like to talk about covers. That's one of my favorite things. And I think your cover is stunning. How did it come about? Yeah, Jessie Bright at Penguin Random House did that cover. I think she just did a fantastic job. I mean, I I love the cover too. You know, I I think it's so catching and and it takes this great image of Lexington, this revered image of Lexington and really gives honor to that image, but basically bringing a modern feel to it. And also with the star, the star, you know, that kind of surrounds him. I I envision that as, you know, a symbol of the war period, you know, that he, that he goes through. And also, of course, he's a star, he's a champion. The actual image of Lexington himself that came from the National Museum of Racing and Hall of, of Fame that gave us the rights to be able to use that image. And then she took it and and did what she did with it. Well, I think it turned out beautifully. Yes. Well, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really liked? So I'm on a quest now to, to read and to gather as much information that I can in terms of subjects that interest me, but also, you know, I, I read to learn from other writers and, and to better my own craft. And, and so the three books that I read, if I can talk really briefly about those three, and I've read these in the last six weeks, they're nonfiction. I love to read fiction by the way, you know, but the, the three books that I focused on recently were all nonfiction books. And And one is a little out of left field, and then the other two are very similar to each other. But um, 
the one that's out of left field is a book called Moon Dust uh, by Andrew Smith. And it was actually recommended to me by my agent. And this is also one of her her clients. And I loved the book. So Moon Dust was written quite some time ago in 2005. And it's uh, Andrew Smith, who is a, a journalist and, and reporter, basically goes on a quest to track down the nine living astronauts who have walked on the moon at that time, nine living astronauts at that time who had walked on the moon and to try to find out from them, what was it like? You know, what was it like to walk on the moon? How did it impact you in your life uh, afterwards and so forth? And so he really gives just this phenomenal journey, you know, of tracking down these, these men and, describing where they were at in their lives then and how it impacted them. So I, I mean, I highly recommend it. He's, he's just a phenomenal interviewer. He was able, able to get access to these men, but he was also able to get them to think beyond maybe even how they thought of themselves, you know, and to uh, answer questions that they had not even thought of, uh, you know, about their own journey. That one sounds really good. I love anything related to space and the visiting the moon. So I'm going to have to add that one to my list. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm going to get it and listen to it because it sounds like it'd be a good listen. It is really good. And he's really great and funny, too. I like it when there's humor mixed in. I agree. He definitely adds some humor in there. So it always makes it lively, you know. Okay, good. The other two books, they kind of go hand in hand. And, you know, of course, the last one that I just finished reading was David Graham's The Wager. And... The book that I read right before I read his was Nathaniel Philbrick's In the Heart of the Sea, which is the book about the the nonfiction book about the um, the well ship Essex, you know, the basis for Moby Dick. Right. Right. Both of these books are kind of similar in that they are involving shipwrecks and then what happens to the men after the shipwrecks. And they they both involve, you know, essentially stories about the captain and their first mates, or in the case of David Grant's book, The Gunner, you know, you look at the roles of the captain and the first mate or the lesser titled men, and, and you just see just this, in both books, you can just really see this, how horror and tragedy is dealt with by both men, you know, both of these men, you know, the captains in both books and then the the gunner and the first mate. And it's almost like a flip of of a reversal of roles, so to speak. You know, you're you're looking at how these men handled uh trauma and devastation and kind of what happens to a human that's on the brink of death, right? And on the brink of of going through, you know, this horrible, horrible incident of tragedy and starvation. And having no home and not knowing if you're ever going to find home again. And it's, it's an interesting look, I think, in both of those books at human nature and what can happen and how various humans deal with these things. Of course, in the heart of the sea, you have the added bonus of the crazed well, you know, that really did attack the ship, you know. And then, of course, Nathaniel Philbrick gives reasons for why he thinks the well attacked the ship. And I mean, they're very plausible and and it's just fascinating. His whole description of the well attacking the ship, which he wrote based on, I think, letters and so forth that he had seen uh, that were written by the men who, who witnessed it. I mean, it's just fascinating, this well, I mean, thrashing about in the water and almost like in the Jaws movie, you know, where he goes out to sea and then he turns around and is he starts thrashing in the water and then he comes barreling back toward the ship for a second time to really give it, you know, the, the blow that sinks it, you know, I mean, so both of those books, I would highly recommend it. If you can read them together because they're just, I mean, if you read them back to back, it's, it's just fascinating. That is fascinating. I haven't read either one of them. I don't know if I'd ever set sail on a ship again, if I read either one of them, but I have heard very good things about both. (laughs) But I'm afraid I'd never, ever head out on the water again. And I really like to head out into the water. So I'm like, (laughs) but I've heard they're both very good. They're both great. If you have any interest in reading something like that. I have heard that. And I've read Nathaniel Philbrick's book about travels with George, where he wrote about Washington when he traveled around all the colonies. And it was so well done. He's a really great writer. Oh, I have not read that. I'd like to read that. Yeah, it's really interesting about 
when he set out, I mean, kind of visiting every one of the colonies. I'm pretty sure it was after he was elected. And then he went colony to colony, just, you know, making his presence known, introducing himself to everybody. It was really interesting. And he and his wife, Philbrick and his wife, recreated that path. And it was very well done. I enjoyed it. I'm going to have to look for it because I would like that. Yeah. Well, this was wonderful, Kim. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and for coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, Culture and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show, or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.